What's going on guys? Welcome back. And today we're doing something a little bit different. We're starting a brand new series. And what this series is, if you guys haven't told, saw by the title now, is we are going to group preview every single group in the Copa America leading, leading up to the actual start of the tournament. Um, so today we are starting with group A and we decided to bring in a guest, I guess Gabriel. Um, Gabriel, tell us a little about yourself and uh, what you do in the, the soccer space or football space. So, hey guys, first of all, it's an honor. Thank you for the invitation. And what I do well, I'm content creator, social media manager at Cabra Centro. I also work on some videos for Cabra Football, uh, you know, talking about South American, Central American ball, um, trying to make all those years of ball knowledge that have you know, <laughs> gathering my head, come to some good use. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. And I love talking about football. I love watching football. Not so good at playing it, but yeah, <laughs> whatever. And, and as in my background, I'm half Argentinian, half Peruvian, but I've lived my entire life in Honduras. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird, but, you know, that's destiny. <laughs> and yeah, so I pretty much consider myself like culturally Honduran. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so just so you got, we brought the perfect guest for the Group A preview. <laughs> so this works out amazing. Um, and Will, how are you doing today, man? Pretty good, pretty good. I was excited. Uh, excited Gabriel's on here. I know. I wish Adam was on here. We could introduce him. But yeah, like Gabriel said, we found the page. I found it uh, a year ago. I saw it. We're going to drop that down in the link, guys, in the description. You guys yep. go check them out, follow them, everything. Really, really good content. I mean, English, Spanish, everything, Central American, you know, South American, they cover it all. It's really good. So, but yeah, pretty good. Ready to dive into Group A and, and get into this. All right. Which which one you guys want to start first? Uh, Gabriel, you're the host. Pick a country for us. Hmm. I think we should start with um, Canada. I don't know how you, how you guys feel about Canada. that. Okay. 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 I got the red. Okay. Off, so. Okay. Interesting. I, 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 had a, I don't know why I had a feeling you're going to say Argentina, but let's roll Canada. Let's go. And <laughs> me and Will, we, we we came here prepared. We got mm -hmm. notes. We spent. We said coming yeah. in is like, all right, let's get a week of research. Like we're not coming in here, like talking off out of our ass. Hey, like you know, no like, opinions. <laughs> this is facts. Straight facts. No opinions. We left that at yeah, the door. Yeah. So facts you know and panama is going to get bounced immediately so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and costa rica is going to get their ass beat so yeah. <laughs> all right we're here we love well, it uh, yeah let's start off with canada uh will i'm mean, not will uh gabriel well you can wait gabriel would you start off i guess your thoughts of canada like just well um i feel individually they have very interesting players tejon buchanan alfonso davies Jonathan David has been having a pretty good season for Leo, especially in the second semester. First semester, he was a bit lackluster, but now I feel he's doing pretty well. Um, I don't know, man, but but collectively, they still haven't convinced me that much. Um, I thought their two, well, the, the three latest matchups that they had, of the you know, the official matches, which were uh, the two Nations League games against... Um, Oh shit! We lost game. Oh one. shit! Oh, <laughs> hopefully I'll hop back on. You want me to go ahead and take it for real quick, Julian, until he hops off? Get back on. Oh, uh, he's beer. He's here. I'll cut it. I'll cut it. What happened? I'll, I'll cut it. Don't worry about. It. I'll cut it. Se corto. Sick. Wait, do I start over or? No, you keep just wherever yeah. you're off top. I'll cut it. I'll cut it in post. Do you hear us? Yeah, for some reason the signal's kind of. I don't know what's going on. Like, are we delayed for you? Yeah. No shoot. Everything's um, frozen. It's kind of weird because I'm I'm not using Wi-Fi. I'm connect, connected to with a LAN cable, and this internet's supposed to be pretty fast. Hmm. Let me see if something's going on. Uh -huh. It doesn't seem like you're delayed. Hmm. So yeah, I'm not frozen, right? No, you're not you're frozen. Good. Are you frozen yeah. on your screen? No, but you guys are. Oh, geez. Oh. Well, I hope I left a good photo. <laughs> I hope I'm smiling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but I think I can hear you better now, so I'll just continue. Okay, yeah. Right where you left off. Right. 
personally, Canada hasn't convinced me that much on a collective level. You know, uh, I feel like against Jamaica, obviously, you know, the Jamaicans had a huge remontada in Canada. So maybe playing at home is not the fortress that it once was. And that can obviously leave some psychological damage on the team. And then I don't know if you guys watched the game against Trinidad, but I felt that Trinidad did have like three or four very clear chances, especially in the first half where they could have taken advantage and they could have, I don't know, uh, won the game because I felt they were more competitive than most people expected. And Alfonso Davies, he wasn't at the level that we usually expect from him. Um, Jonathan David, not that much, you know, and, and what's this guy's name? The, the Nashville player, I feel he's, He's probably been one of the most consistent players for Canada. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, mm. uh, Eustachio, uh, is he going to make it, though? I, I thought he was injured or something. Uh, I'm not too sure. Double check that. Yeah, but yeah. And I think Schaffelberg, even though his form has dropped a little bit for Nashville, I feel like he can be a very important player, whether it's starting or coming off the bench. So... Yeah, my I think my final point would be that I think individually it's a very interesting team with a lot of potential. Collectively, not very convincing. And if the three South American teams are, you know, at their full potential, I don't see Canada making it to the next round. Mm. Yeah, Julian, I'm going to go ahead and hop on it. Yeah, I'm just trying to check the stack, yo, if he's injured oh. or not. Yeah, yeah. I kind of got to agree with Gabriel. Overall, individually, I mean, this team, I think we even saw it at the 2022 World Cup uh, when they were playing in their first game against Belgium. You know, this team is explosive, you know. And I have to say, I remember being like a Panamanian supporter, the game at BMO Field and the qualifier. It was, I think it was 2021. I don't know if you guys remember this. Uh, Gabriel, you might. There was a moment, it was the second goal Canada scored. The ball like was rolling out and it was practically out of bounds. And Harold Cummings, he's another story, by the way. Oh, shit, we lost him. I'll keep going, keep going. though. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much, long story short, Harold Cummings, I mean, he, he's obviously, he's he's probably like one of the biggest jokes in Panama of a CB. All right. We got you back, Gabriel. Sorry, I, I lost you guys again. I don't know what happened. You good? Can you hear us now, though? Yeah, I can hear you. You can? All right. Perfect. All right, I'll keep going. But, yeah, pretty much in that game, Harold Cummings kind of, like, just watches the ball roll out. The ball looks like it's about to completely go out, you know. Also, Harold Cummings is kind of another laughing stock in the, the Panamanian defense. So, But that's another story for another day. The ball goes out. Alfonso Davies sprints by it, gets it, goes by, shoots and scores. The whole point I try to say by that is Canada's team is explosive, and, and they've been able to show moments like that. Not only, obviously, in the World Cup qualifiers, but at the World Cup itself. I mean, obviously, in that Belgium game, even in that Croatia game, you know, scored first, took the lead early. Individually, this team has a lot of bright points. Uh, you guys mentioned one big name, Jacob Schalferberg. I have to say, I mean, he really saved Canada the last game. I mean, his goal, his second goal was big. But also, like Gabriel was saying, I think defensively, uh, this team... They just lack a lot in the defense. And, I mean, they, they're switching guys in and out. Kamal Miller, you know, Kamal Miller, he uh, he, he sometimes, that's Julian's boy from Inter-Miami, or former Inter-Miami player. But he just never really has that strong of a game when it comes to the national team, it feels like. He has decent games. Steven Victoria was another former center back that they had. He lacks as well. I mean, he's also getting up in age, so I don't even think they're going to call him in. You know, so it's it's kind of like a debate who you're going to have, Zach McGraw. Are you going to have, I think in the Trinidad game, they had, oh, I can't remember his name, but he plays for Montreal, if I'm not wrong. Waterman. 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 Joel Waterman, yeah. So it, it's Speaking kind of, of like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like a toss up. Like, what are you going to have? And obviously, the wing play for Canada is probably their strong suit. I think even in the midfield, Ismail Kone is going to be a great, great prodigy. I think he's going to be honestly the future of Tiba Hutchinson for the team, but he still lacks that performance with the national team. He's had good, solid games, but I mean, even Gabriel said it earlier, look at the Jamaica game, look at the Trinidad game. When you're able to physically match with the Canadian team, 
and really, really match with their speed, which is another big characteristic that this team has up top with Tejon, with even Kyle Larin, you know, and of course, Jonathan David and Alfonso and them, you're able to beat this team, I would say, quite competitively. Trinidad made it, you know, obviously, realistically, when you look at just the depth chart on both teams, they're, they don't even compare to them, not even close. I mean, other than Levi Garcia, yeah. but they they had so many different chances in that game and they almost converted and Canada was almost looking at the Copa America from back home. But we're in a different stage. I think collectively, though, the big points are going to have to be the center back positioning, whether, like I, like you said, uh, Julian, whether it's Waterman, whether it's Zach McGraw, uh, and also the goalkeeping. I think Maxine Crepeau, if I'm not incorrect, is coming in decent form with the Timbers. Not really the best. They haven't been the hottest team as of late. He's been conceding a lot. So it's going to be a lot of issues there. A lot of Canadians didn't like Milan Borgian. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I didn't mind him. I thought he was a DC keeper. Well, no, no. I, so, you want to speak on it, him, he we is scored eight goals against him. He is terrible. <laughs> he is terrible. You want to know how bad he is? He is rough. Yeah, I was looking at his club history. So, one, he plays in Slovakia, I believe. Mm-hmm. He's getting he's getting pulled out of games. <laughs> wow. He's That's getting bad. pulled out of games. I saw one Reese. So, and then I don't think he's. He's even started. He got pulled at the 45th minute in a game. And that's in the Slovakian league. <laughs> that's in the Slovakian yeah. league. And look, yeah. Maxine Crepo, he's shown moments where he can be good. I mean, he's part of he was a big reason in that LAFC run a couple years ago when they made it to the run. Obviously, he broke his leg in the final, which is tragic. Um, yeah. But he's to me, he is their best goalkeeper. I mean, you can look at St. Clair out of Minnesota. But if you look at a guy who's played at higher levels, I think you got to go with Maxine Crepeau uh, and the goalkeeper position for me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You guys want to move to positives? Or Julian, do you want to give your uh, overview on yeah. Canada? So um, as we're recording this, and I'm surprised none of you guys mentioned it yet, but Jesse March is now the coach of this team. <laughs> so when you look at this March window and – Pretty much since John Herdman left, there's just Canada has been this massive debacle when it comes to like financial issues and having to cancel games and uh, losing their coach because of these financial issues and potential corruption. And then they bring in Jesse March, which I don't know if you guys know this, but the three MLS teams had to pull money together to contribute to pay for Jesse March's salary. So Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto have all come together to bring him in which look if <laughs> these owners i doubt they're doing this for free so <laughs> i'm curious like what could potentially be the long-term effects of this but as for this team going forward i think they hired the perfect coach for what they are i think what they've been able to do as of recently has been a little lackluster but i think you have a guy in jesse marsh who has really good trial run friendlies against the Netherlands and France coming up, which are going to be really good tests, which is outside of Argentina. Those are going to be better than Chile in Peru. Now the defense is where Canada really, really struggles. The up top, like you guys are saying is incredible. Very, very good. I think the second bet, I think if you look at that team on paper, they might be the second best team in that group, in my opinion, personally. I mean, yeah. you have a guy in Alfonso Davies who literally just scored in a Champions League semifinal. You have Kyle, um, Jonathan David, who, like you said, Gabriel's lighting it up in the French League this second half of the season and has really gone on a run. And not even just this season, but last season as well. I think the type of system and the scheme that Jesse Marsh likes to run, a very high press, heavy, it's, it's suited very well for them. And, Will, I know you mentioned that if you can keep up with the pace and the speed of Canada, you can pretty much shut them down. But if you look at this group outside yeah. of Argentina, if you look at Peru and Chile, I mean, are these guys keeping up with these guys? And we're going to get into the other two countries in a bit, but like there's no shot. And I think where Canada excels at is athleticism. I mean, these guys have track stars on this team and are, have a lot of quality and are really good on the ball. Um, I do want to mention a guy that I like and who's been playing really well 
in the CONCACAF Champions Cup coming off the bench, Russell Rowe. I think he could be a potential, if you're getting a Tejan Buchanan who is just not showing up, I think he could be a good slot in for him. Because I've noticed not just for Canada, but also for Inter, because of that lack of playing time, he's had a hard time really getting flowing since he's left Belgium. So I think it's good to have a guy like Russell Rowe who's been really excelling right now at a pretty high level in a for this region, the best competition in CONCACAF and one of the best in this side of the hem- hemisphere. So I think the best formation for Canada has to be a 3-4-3. I think that's where they excel the most. And I'm curious to see what Jesse, Jesse Marsh does because they have the quality in the midfield and up top. It's just defensively, you need to have three center backs back there. You have to because they're going to get torched. And I expect them to get scored on. And for me, the only way they really excel in this group is if they light up goals because they're going to be leaky. They're going they're going to give up goals. It's just a matter of can they score enough to win games. But yeah, that's kind of like yeah. my overview of what I think for them. So, what 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 is your highs, Will? I guess. Uh, I was going to say yeah. Do you guys want to move into highs and lows, Julian? Yeah, let's go. That go. I got y'all. Gabriel, do you want to start us off? What is your what's your what are your couple highs for Canada? Yeah, when it comes to highs, I think. Like there is a slight chance they make it to the quarterfinals, and that to me is the, the the highest they can go. And then, you know, low lowest would be last place in this group, which I think is a possibility. Like I still hold on to my opinion that they're not making it through, and they're not winning third place either. I think, like the experience and the baggage of the South American teams is going to really show in this group stage. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get like like you were saying, we'll get that when we get into other teams. For me, my high for this team, and I think like you even kind of just mentioned it, Julian, they got Jesse Marsh now. This is a guy, I mean, we saw when they had John Herdman, this team, I mean, I forgot exactly what the quote was, but before they went to go play Croatia, you know, the team that in the previous World Cup made it to the second place or to the final and were runners up in the World Cup. And they said, I remember, uh, not Jesse Marcy, excuse me, uh, John Herdman the night before said, we're going to go out there and we're going to go fuck them up. You know, so <laughs> this team, they have this like this moxie to them. And I mean, we see it with the players, with Fonzie, with Jonathan, with Tejon. You know, these guys always, when they play, they always seem like to have a chip on their shoulder. So I think that's a big high for them rolling into it. I think this team can, they can be quarters. I think they can make the quarterfinals. Now, obviously, depending on group B, how it finishes out with Mexico, with Venezuela and them, I think it's favorable for Canada. I think it's definitely a more favorable draw than the other side of the bracket, whether or not they'd have to get like a Colombia or Brazil. So I think that's something for them. I will say, though, I think for the Canadian Federation, the goal is to make out of the group. That's a high. Low, I think a low, uh, this might be pushing it a little bit, but I think a low, low could be they score one goal the entire tournament and lose all three games. I mean, this team at times, they really, really struggle to find uh, that that collectivity with all of each other. Individually, great talents. They can do it. They can boss out. But when it comes to the team aspect, and this is especially, this is this is Comable. This is Copa America, man. These guys are going to try to take your head off. Yeah, we're going to talk about Peru. We're going to talk about Chile. Whether or not people want to say they're in the dumps right now, they're an absolute shithouse team, whatever it is, this is still Come Bowl. This is their tournament. They're coming in to our land. And for them, th- this is everything. Like they are going to go head beyond and they're going to fight for that, that game. So I just don't think anything's going to be given to Canada. So I feel like that's a low for them. Yeah, for me, it's it's getting out of the group stage, uh, which I think is is it's realistic. And like you said, well, th- their path is very good because I could see a world they get second place in the group, and then whoever comes out of that, Mexico or Ecuador, whoever, I could almost see a world where they could sneak out a victory there, just due to the path they. You know, you could see a, a sneaky little 
Cinderella run, but I think it's possible. Is it likely? I don't know. Probably not. But as for a low, honestly, I think I'm just a little higher than you guys. I think a low is third place. I just, I have a very, very hard time picking them to be behind Peru. Just due to individual talent, what I've seen, and like, we look, we make fun of other CONCACAF countries, made fun of Canada and their performance in the World Cup. But considering the group, they actually looked good in certain games. Sure, they didn't score a goal, but there was moments where they were controlling like pretty high level teams like Belgium. And uh, I think it was the Belgium game is the big one. But yeah, that's kind of like my low. I think they're beating Peru. I just, I can't, I can't imagine them losing that game. Is that your hot take? With the form that Peru has been in and the quality that's on that team. And you got to remember all these players are coming in super hot and they're, they have really good friendlies coming up and look, that might shake the way I feel about everything, but look, if they look half decent against Netherlands and France, that's a good warm up match, man. I know it's a different style of play and the way they go about it. And it, maybe that fits more their style versus like a more hard nosed, scrappy, uh, Peruvian or Chilean side. But that, that's just kind of what I think. Now, do I think it's necessarily impossible they get last? I think it is possible, but I just don't think that's their low. I, I, I can't imagine. I just, I don't think they get last. I have a hard time picking the on last. But who's right. scoring the goals for Canada who's in these games? I think it's going to be by committee. Honestly, I don't see one guy getting a hat trick. Yeah. I think you're going to get a Jonathan David goal, Alfonso David goal, Kyle Laren goal. It's going to be kind of reining it in by committee because, man, and maybe we can transition over to uh, one of these next two countries, but watching both Chile and Peru, like, man, they just look so slow, so slow. And I know Chile played France, which is one of the best teams, if not the second best team in the world. Um, but seeing the way they got torched by like guys like Dembele and and Mbappe, like look, Alfonso Davies, John Dave, like these guys are just as fast. And I like, I don't know. I guess we'll we'll see. But um, let's move over. Let's do actually. Well, I'll let you pick. Give, give me the next one. Well, before we move, Canada Glazer right here, man. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm just that. trying to be like. I'm just I, looking I'm, at this like realistically, like to me yeah. at least. I feel like if I'm going based you. off recent performances and stuff, like. Well, you know what? We're talking about it. We're already you're you're kind of already trashed on them a little bit. Let's get to Peru. Uh, I kind of want to talk about them. Let's start off first thing. Who are players to watch out for you, Gabriel? Who are some guys that you just think they're going to have a good showcase, or they have to have a good one for Peru? Yeah, that's that's a complicated question. Like I'm, I'm <laughs> I look at the roster, for the games against the DR and um, and Nicaragua, and Peru unfortunately is still depending on Paolo Guerrero because there hasn't been well. There's also Gianluca Lapadula who plays for Cagliari and he's been doing all right in Italy. Mm-hmm. But uh, let's be honest, Guerrero is Guerrero, and he's always been the Peruvian icon. Yeah. But Peru's having trouble with this like generational transition because it's hard to find quality players that can replace the ones that we once had. So there's Marcos Lopez, who's kind of young, and he does play for Feyenoord, but you know he doesn't have that much continuity. Uh, he's not exactly a starter for the Dutch team. Then you have Piero Quispe, who oh, for many... We lost him. Did you lose me? No, he's here for me. I have him. Can you hear me? Yeah, I have you. Yeah. So I continue? Yeah, yeah, yep. you're good. You're good. You're good. Right. you're good. Cool, cool. Then there's Piero Quispe, who for many was like the most promising player to come out of Peru as of lately, and he joined Pumas in Liga MX. And yeah, he hasn't been exactly, you know, the best. So maybe some players to watch out for, I guess, Renato Tapia, because he's the one that's playing pretty much at the highest level. He's playing for Celta Amigo. And then still... 
you know, Mr. Frozone, Luis Alvincula, who's been really clutch for Boca Juniors. He was essential for them to make the Copa Libertadores final. He was yeah. very important uh, in, in, in past uh, Copa America campaigns for Peru. Let's remember, though, that we can talk a lot of trash about Peru and everything, but Peru has made it into the quarterfinals in the last five editions, being uh, third place, I think, twice. And also, um, well, and during the last Copa America where Argentina won, they were fourth place. So, oh yeah, they were they were third place twice, runners up once, and fourth place once. So we're talking about a team that they might not be doing their best right now. Their talent is not top notch. I'll concede that. And they have a new coach who still hasn't, you know, been that much with them. But when Copa America comes, Peru is always a pretty competitive team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's true. I Julian, want to bring up. Yeah. yeah, I was. I wanted to bring it because I was. And the biggest thing that I'm seeing with Peru is the lack of scoring. Yeah. Since World Cup qualifying, they've only scored one goal in the last one, two, three, four, five, six games. One goal, and that's really, really rough. I mean, yeah, just, losing just, to Bolivia two zero is. Just, <laughs> I mean, just think about it. You have Paulo Guerrero, who's like 40 or 41, and then the yeah. next striker in line is Gianluca Lapadula, who's already 34. So there's absolutely yeah. no transition. There's no third striker that you could say, all right, we can depend on this guy to score. Mm-hmm. So that makes it extremely difficult for Peru to, you know, to move ahead. Because back then, think about it. Ten years ago, Peru had Paolo Guerrero and freaking Claudio Pizarro, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you also had Jefferson Farfan, Loco Vargas. You had players that you could count on to, like, score. Yeah. And create chances right now that doesn't it, it doesn't look like that uh, the team has a lot less quality than it once had but as i said before you know peru when it comes to copa america is always a dangerous team we'll also see how oliver sun um he, performs. The dual he, mat. Yeah. yeah yeah he he wasn't born in peru he was born in denmark and he plays over there and, and let's see how he does let's see if he gets called up because i uh, we'll have to wait yeah i did want to ask you how much do you think Gareca really had this Peruvian team over? Do you feel that they over, he had them overperform than how good they actually are? Definitely. I feel, I mean, I look at Peru's talent pool from, let's say, Russia 2018. And like at first sight, they aren't even that far from like the top Central American teams. Like I, I feel like from a talent perspective, not, not as a team, but individually, looking at the players, Peru was maybe on par with Costa Rica and, and Panama. But Gareca, who's an incredible coach, an incredible motivator, really took the best out of them. And I, I don't know if you guys have the same feeling, if you guys watched the World Cup, but Peru could have done a lot better and they could have made it out of the group stage because they played really good matches, especially against France and Denmark. So, so Gareca, I mean, the guy, I, I think he's still worshipped in Peru, and many people were really sad that he had to leave. And especially, not only that he had to leave, but he had to leave to Chile, because I don't know if you guys know this, but Peru and Chile are rivals in pretty much everything. Yeah. Like, when yeah. it comes to culture, I know. Yeah. food, everything, they're big rivals. And the fact that Gareca is now on the other side, it, it does hurt. So, so, yeah, I mean, Gareca, incredible coach. And you can already tell that his work is 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 – you know, it's it's working in Chile because you're seeing that there's also being a there's also a small transition taking place where players like Dario Osorio, Lucas Asadi are slowly becoming consistent players for La Selección Chilena. So I think um, I think that's good. As for Peru, we, we now have Jorge Fosati, who's a very experienced coach who knows the region extremely well. But he's mostly known for like coaching clubs. Like uh, I think his latest gigs have been with clubs. So we'll see how he does with Peru now. Yeah. Uh I yeah, do. Julian. So I, I mentioned the attack. How how are you feeling about the defense of this Peruvian team? Because I'm also seeing that they have one clean sheet. Um, and that was pretty much against a, a say a weaker Paraguay side since the a team that couldn't score qualifier. against me. Yeah. World yeah. Cup qualifiers. That can just try to play of the word. Yeah, it's not looking that good. So first, we can start with the goalkeeper. I think I think Ayese is a good goalkeeper. He's been the, one of the most consistent goalkeepers mm-hmm. in MLS. 
and he's always come clutch in, in Copa America. He's always been pretty good. But then the other guys, they don't convince me that much. If you think about it, Advincula, even though he is a right back, he's mostly, like, he behaves like a right wing back, which means that his role is much more attacking than defensive. Like, because he's always in front, he usually leaves, leaves big spaces in the back. So that's very dangerous. Then, as I said before, you have Marcos Lopez, who plays for Feyenoord, but the guy, well, he is in Feyenoord, but he doesn't play for Feyenoord. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, like, there, but he's not getting that much playing time, let's be honest. He was a San Jose Earthquakes player before. Uh, we'll see. Then you have uh, Miguel Trauco, Aldo Corso, who are both players that are very, you know, they, they're very experienced. They know what it feels like to wear La Selección's shirt. And the other guys, they don't convince me that much. Alexander Cayens, who I believe was a New York City FC player before, and now he's playing in Greece with AEK, that team that just bottled the league in Greece. Then, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, it's like Pauk is pretty much the next champion. So, yeah, this team, I'm not feeling very confident about the team, like individually speaking. But who knows? Like if they click during the tournament, then they're very dangerous. We're, and we already, we've already seen this from Peru, that they might come with a team that you're like, whoa, these guys are ass. <laughs> they're not going to make it past the group <laughs> thing. And then out of nowhere, you're like, how did, they, how did these guys make it to the semifinals? And they do it. Yeah. So you yeah. never know. Yeah, I will say with the Galese, I always felt like – he should have progressed. As, he he could have made it farther than just MLS. That guy was really good, and I he felt did. like he should have gone farther. Yeah, he's like Andre staying. Blake, pretty much like Andre Blake. Yeah, yeah, I don't understand why Andre Blake stayed. Andre Blake had the ability to make his a deeper career, but yeah, who yeah. knows? Um, one thing Keep I do talking. want to mention with Baru oh, is um, the friendlies coming up. I would be a little disappointed um, if. These are my friendlies going into Copa America. It's El Salvador and Paraguay, a team, Paraguay team that is pretty weak in you've already drew them. And then a very, very weak El Salvador team. I felt like there should have been a better friendly leading into this tournament. Maybe. Uh, I don't know if this might be the reason why, but. For example, the last two friendlies Peru had were pretty weak too. They were against Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if there's some like mental psychological reason why they might want to play these teams because maybe if they maybe, win, yeah. they can come with a, like a high to the tournament. They can be like, oh, you know what, we can do this. Mm-hmm. Now, I think they can win against El Salvador, against Paraguay, even though Paraguay doesn't have the best team, and you also have to take into consideration that they might yeah. split up because of Paris 2024. Um, they'll have a hard time beating Paraguay. Still, because I think Paraguay has some very decent players, so we'll see about that. But um, but yeah, it would have been a lot better to have like tougher friendlies. Uh, you know, checking out who who was free. I don't know. It could have been better. I think it could have been a better like mini preseason for Peru. Yeah, anything would have been better than El Salvador. <laughs> anything would have been better. Yeah. I gotta, Anything. I gotta agree with Gabriel though. I think it's like the vibes. I mean, Fonsati's yeah, two yeah. first games were against Nicaragua and Dominican Republic. This team, I mean, you guys know we don't have to say it, and I'm gonna kind of get to a couple names in a sec. This team is in last place in Colme Bowl World Cup qualifying as of right now. Of course, that could change. Anything, it's only six games in. We still have 12 more games to go, so it's a long ways. But this team, they lost to Bolivia. They've lost or they tied Venezuela in in Lima. I mean, obviously, they lost as well to Chile at Chile. So this team is not at all connecting on any cylinders previously last year. Obviously, going into this year, new head coach, Futsati. I went to Peru a couple of years ago. And I mean, obviously, Gareca. I remember when I went there, everybody I talked to, I mean, this guy was a freaking, he was the Lord Jesus Christ to these people. I mean, he kind of looks like his hair, dude. Like, <laughs> he, looks at a, he looks like the guy. But the thing is, Everybody loved him there when he left. And I mean, you guys mentioned it when he left as well. And it it also sucks the way he left penalty shootout to get to the world cup to Australia. I mean, that that's, that sucks, dude. That really hurts, but he built this team up to genuinely what it has been in the past uh, 10 years or so. The thing is though, I think Fonsati has, you know, obviously we, we've mentioned it and there's no big names, but the two names that really, really just stick out to me. And I think Fasadi, he realizes that he has to get the most out of these guys and he's got to like string them like a soaking towel and drip every single ounce that he can get from them is Renato Tapia and Gianluca Lapadula. 
Both yeah. of these guys have been, I mean, just absolutely critical for the team. What Lapadula has been able to do, I haven't really kept up with him in Serie A. I know his team got promoted about a year or two ago from Serie B up to the first division in Italy. But he, he hasn't looked the worst, but he also hasn't looked the best. Now, I will say, though, I don't know if it's the mask that he puts on. I don't know if it's because he's half Italian. I don't know what it is. But when he puts on that Peru national team jersey, I mean, the guy literally becomes Superman. He's fighting for balls. He's going everywhere. He's all over the pitch. Uh, that's just a big thing. And also they're talking a little bit about the midfield with Renato Tapia. I mean, I would say he's had pretty a decent season with Celta Vigo, even, the, even though the team looks like uh, they're not going to get relegated, but they are literally one yeah. place above the relegation zone. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, it's, a they're down, really, it's a down year for Celta Vigo. Yeah, yeah so it, it hasn't been obviously at all a good year for him. But I think Renato Tapia has still kept up his uh, physique. He's still kept up his his maturity he's still going he's still growing but 1995 also guys a little bit on the overview is the last time peru did not make it out of the group stage as much as we can sit here julian you and me we can joke around you know we could say oh dude f peru they're not going to do this their team sucks you have to put some respect on their name 2019 just a few years ago they made a final they made a final granted they lost that final to brazil but they still made a final and they beat the likes of Chile. And this was a stacked Chile team in those years. They also beat Uruguay and penalty kicks. So this is not, you know, and that even in those years, that was not an incredible stacked roster team, but you can't take anything away from the Peruvians. Um, they can bring a lot to the table. I think it, like I, like you guys said, we kind of summed it up really well on the team analysis. This team they, they're obviously lacking creativity. They're lacking depth. They're lacking numbers. They're, I mean, they're not lacking in age. I mean, the team is probably about 5,000 years old, you know. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's one of those you have to look at it, and it's a gut feeling, you know. But we'll get into it a little bit with highs and lows uh, and stuff. Gabriel, you want to start us I off? Did, uh, ahead, I do want to ask Gabriel one question, though. Uh, sure. Since you've uh, followed this team probably more than the both of us, where does this roster – rank compared to the last 20 years though honestly it's probably the worst worst roster (laughs) yeah Yeah, so like and that's and that's kind of where i want to get at with the the whole um like looking into the pat and not making it out of the group stage and continue to do it but it's like this is probably the worst peruvian roster in the past 20 years and if you go anything based off of the world cup qualifiers. I mean, it is really rough. And since pretty much them getting knocked out of the playoff round in 2022, uh, I, I looked it up. They've only won four games since the beginning of 2023. So about a year and a half. And that was against Bolivia, um, South Korea, which is, that's a good win. And then the last two Nicaragua and Dominican Republic. So a Bolivia team, who's probably the worst team in the entire uh, tournament a Nicaraguan and a Dominican Republic team who have never played in any sort of continental Copa America tournament. So South Korea was a big win, but uh, that's just something I'm looking at off, off of yeah, recently. It was also, you have to remember, it was also Jurgen Klinsmann, South Korea. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Who absolutely underperformed at the the Asian Cup. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens because I think there's a chance that, yeah, Peru has some players abroad, but they might also call up players from especially Universitario and Alianza Lima because surprisingly, even though Universitario is pretty much knocked out and Alianza Lima, they're still in, in, in contention, but it's very... It's, they're they're it's, gone, dude. Yeah. I saw the game last night. Yeah. <laughs> that was rough. They haven't performed as bad as Peruvian clubs usually do because if you look back... Peruvian mm-hmm. teams are awful at Copa Libertadores and Copa Sudamericana. Like in the last 10 years, I think maybe only Sporting Cristal made it to the round of 16 once, and that was it. Yeah. And Alianza Lima has like a horrible record that they haven't won at home, I don't know, in 20 years maybe, and so like that. So, yeah. but the fact that they haven't been that bad, it may show that Fosati has players to look forward to in the Peruvian league. But then we'll see because. Players that did shine before, like Andre Carrillo. Andre Carrillo was always pretty good for Peru, but he's now playing in Saudi. And then you also have the player who was supposed to be the number 10 of this generation, uh, Christian Cueva, 
He played for Sao Paulo. He played for pretty decent teams, but he lost it. So he started partying too much, and he was supposed to be, like, the leader of the midfield. And now that you don't have him, you don't really have a player that has, like, these creative capabilities. Like, maybe Piero Quispe, but as I said, Piero Quispe in Pumas has been kind of relevant. So, so... I, I wouldn't going? want to rely on anybody who plays for Pumas. You wouldn't rely on Chino Puerto? Oh, man. No, 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 no. But Not yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to like highs and lows, I think Peru, like, they might make it to the quarterfinals. And, and, my low would be just like with Canada, it might be like a Jorge Fossati disaster class and the whole team doesn't connect. There's no click, there's no order, and they end up being last. So I think both Canada and Peru face very similar scenarios. Like I see them staying in the group, but I also see them that if they advance, they will make it that far. Like Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, Jamaica, uh, Mexico, I feel that they're too much for them. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I I got to go. I'm going to take it, knock it just down a step a little bit. Canada, I could see. I don't know, just something about their team, something about knockout football I could see. Peru, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to doubt history. I don't want to look it in the face and say, F you, like you're not going to do this. And I want to say a disclaimer to all Peruvians, to all people watching. We are not Peruvian haters. We don't hate the Peru national team. We're not... We're not against these guys. I actually root for them. I really do. You know, a couple of Panamanian players play over there. I mean, you guys probably know Cecilia Waterman, Giovanni Ramos, both play in Alianza Lima. We have another guy, Joseph Cox, who's a center forward. He hasn't made it to the national team in a while, but he plays over there in Peru as well. So, you know, I like watching the league. I think it's a competitive league. I think it's a solid. It's definitely not the worst league in Colme Bowl by no stretch of the imagination. But the thing is, realistically, coming into this tournament, Another thing, we kind of talked a little bit about it, and not to go back to Canada again, but kind of going with Peru, and we'll talk about it with the next two teams up ahead. More than likely, I don't know how well the Canadians travel. I haven't seen them travel that well, but almost every single game, except, of course, the Argentina game, will probably feel like a home game for Peru. I have quite well that they're going to travel pretty well. I haven't looked at the venues yet, where they're playing, but I know I'm pretty sure... They Peru definitely plays in Miami, and that's yeah. probably going to be their biggest yeah. attendance. Uh, they later, to check yeah, the other yeah, ones, yeah, but Miami is going to be the yeah because Peru. We have like La U has does friendly here's every year. There's a lot of Peruvians mm-hmm. in South Florida, um, mm-hmm. so that one's going to be their biggest probably uh, attendance. I'd have to check the other ones, but I, if I'm not wrong, I want to say they play Chile in Dallas, Texas, which. Watching, I mean that—that's the you know, classico, like Gabriel was saying, for South America and yes, da- yeah. in AT and T, in AT and T, watching Chile, Peru. But I feel that that that'll be a positive. They'll be able to have to rely on that. I think Max, the high for this team, if I have to say, it's going to be four points. I think they somehow. I, I'm going to be honest. I just don't see them beating uh, Chile. I, I I really don't see them beating Argentina. But I just don't see them beating either two of those teams. I can see them scraping out a win against Canada. Dirty, fashion, old-style Kome Bowl. They run in there, and it's just a physical battle, and they beat them. And then I could maybe – I could even potentially see last match day, because if I'm not incorrect, I remember the schedule. They play Argentina last, if I'm not wrong. They do. In the group stage. So at that point, Argentina could have already sealed up qualification to the next phase. Six points. They could maybe be rolling out a B roster, maybe not. Granted, then again, it is Argentina, so we'll have to see. And maybe they yeah, slip up. Yeah, their B roster is like insane. Like right. <laughs> that B roster is still better than Peru. Yeah, but still, the thing is, though, I think I mean talking about rosters, even mentality, though, they kind of might be looking at that game more of like a hey, let's kind of rest up, let's relax up, and let's get ready for the knockout phase, which is obviously where the real, real football begins. But yeah, I think that's a high. As a low, though, I got to completely agree with Gabriel. I think they're completely – there's miscommunications on all aspects. Fans maybe don't travel well. Players don't get up for the games. I mean, Pedro Galese literally has to turn into freaking San Galese again. You know, this guy – I mean, there's a reason why they call him El Pulpo. Like, I see his hands 
this guy, he's all over the place when he plays with Peru, which sucks because he does not have a defense. I mean, and speaking of, not to get back to the names, but Carlos Zambrano. Well, you're an Orlando City fan, dude. We get it. We get it. <laughs> I got another guy. <laughs> Carlos, Carlos Zambrano plays with Alianza Lima. He might be the starting center back for this national team in this tournament. That might be good. one of – he's not good. He, I would rather like – I mean, he's an in and out, dude. This guy, he's a McDonald's. He's a he's a cheeseburger factory. You wanted something, you can go in, you can get it. Cheeseburger, hot dogs, chicken nuggets, dude, whatever you want. Carlos Zambrano will deliver it to your house. I mean, he's that type of defender. He's just unreliable. So open I could twenty four hours. Open he's a hey, open twenty four hours. <laughs> so he's an Uber driver. Uh, um I'm gonna start off with low because that's at their low is they don't even score a single goal. Like that that's that's the low. Like realistic like a, like I said, one goal in six games, and you're like against Venezuela, uh, which obviously Venezuela is a much improved team, but it's still like it's Venezuela, like as, as well. Yeah. That's that that's very worrisome. Um, so I think that's the low is that they they don't even score a goal. Um, the high, I think the high is kind of like what you said, Will, where because of the emotion and the rivalry, they beat a Chile, and then I see a draw against Canada. I think that's the high. Now whether or not that's enough to get out of the group, I don't know because. Now we're talking goal differential, and Peru, they're just not going to put enough goals to advance on goal differential. No. And that's the only way you get out with four points, in my opinion, is if you 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 got like a plus five goal differential. So that's kind of my eye right there. So I guess fourth and third. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's go to Chile. Argentina. We talked. Oh, you want to do Argentina? Uh, yeah, let's do Argentina. I feel like we've talked absolutely no Argentina. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to go say first. Like, um, the players, who are players you want to watch man. out for, Julian, on this team? I mean, you can say the whole roster. You can yeah. say one guy. <laughs> like this is probably going to be our shortest group, the, our shortest uh, team. Like, let's be real. This is mm-hmm. this is Argentina's tournament. Um, we're potentially looking at an Argentina team who might be one of the best teams, not international teams ever with this run that they're in. Um, I want to say I have to double check, but I think since 2019 in five years, they've only lost two games. And that was against Saudi Arabia. Uruguay. And um, Uruguay. Uruguay. Yeah. In five years, they've lost two games. Now, that's a world cup. <laughs> And a Copa America, and look, these teams aren't even remotely in the same class. Like, I think Argentina could win this group with their B squad. Now, I am curious to see. I don't think there's going to be much changes outside of maybe the back line. Um, it seems that Scaloni likes Julian Alvarez. I man, so L- Lataro Martinez, he's one of those guys, man. He is like an enigma because he's like he absolutely tears. He he tore it up this year. He had a, he he started to like slow down at the end of the season, but with an inter team who was clearly the best team in City, A, it wasn't even close. He had an amazing season for them. I think it was around twenty six goals somewhere around there. Yeah, but it seems since the World Cup. And even a little bit before that, he just seems to never be that same guy with Argentina for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because he's not the guy like he is at Inter and maybe stylistically because that Inter team is a super transition, play fast, get down the field, score goals uh, versus Argentina likes to play a little bit more possession baseball. Um, So that... The striker, I'm a little curious to see what they do. Um, I do think this is probably going to be Messi and Di Maria's uh, last hoorah. I'd be really shocked. I think Di Maria already came out and said that he's yeah. he's done yeah. after this. Uh, Messi's been – hasn't really said anything, but 
I think this might be his last go. They're just going to absolutely wipe the floor with this group. It's it's not even close. I think this is just their tournament to win. The only one that really competes with them is Brazil. This is an Argentina team that that really is really good. And I'm curious what your guys' thoughts on like this generation and like this kind of era of Argentina we're living in now, like where it kind of ranks like all yeah. the time. Like we look at that Spanish team or uh the Brazilian teams. Like where where did that fit for you guys? Gabriel, what are yeah, I was gonna ask you, what are who are your like main players to watch out for and what's your overview going into the tournament for Argentina? Hmm, let's let's see. I think when it comes to new players, maybe I think he was in the squad for the World Cup, but now he's a completely new player. It would have to be Ezequiel Palacios, because mm-hmm. back in the World Cup he was a he was pretty much a bench warmer for Bayer Leverkusen. But then Xavi mm-hmm. also came in and he completely transformed them, and he was a very important player for them as they were fighting for the Bundesliga, Europa League, and and German Cup titles. So so I think he's a player to watch. Um, and he's, he's on the younger side. I think he's only 24 or 25. I'm also really interested in what happens with the striker, as Julian said, because Julian Alvarez and Lautaro are very different players in the sense that Julian is more of a sacrifice type of player. That yeah. I, I almost see him as a false nine. Like He's not really a guy that feels comfortable as a striker, but he feels comfortable like coming from behind. And meanwhile, Lautaro, he's like a number nine. And I feel like the reason he had that drop in form uh, during the last two months is because that penalty against Atletico Madrid had its toll, like a psychological toll on him because he like felt that maybe he was guilty for Inter Milan not making it to the next round of the Champions League where they were they were one of the favorites. I believe that Inter Milan... Yeah. I, I was with the... Like, I had Inter as a dark horse to, like, legit... Cause look, Luka, like, I know it's a little off topic. Lukaku costed them that last, that last go. And the way that team built and how they play, like, they were, to me, like, a serious, serious dark horse. But you like Latara can't blame. Did you see the up close footage of the magic? Yeah. How, like how it just <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I think I had to do with the fact that the pitch is hybrid and some of the parts are like plastic and other parts are real grass. And like he might have like pressed on a patch and then it, it <laughs> lifted up the ball. And then when he kicked it, it just went up in the air. So it wasn't entirely his fault, but you still like feel responsible yeah. and it still weighs in your conscience. So. So, yeah, maybe that affected him in, during the last games, even though Inter Milan was pretty much, you know, yeah, like you could tell from like a month back that they were going to be the champions. They were yeah. simply the best team in Italy on all, yeah. on all lines. So so we'll see who Scaloni chooses, because I think he likes Julian more than Lautaro, as you said. I agree. But we'll see. We also have to see if he plans on, I, I don't know if he's going to call Matias Sole who had a pretty good season for Frosinone. I don't know if he's going to go with them or if he's going to go to Paris. Uh, there's also Garnacho. Garnacho is a very interesting player, although he has been kind of green for La Selección. I, I I think he still needs to grow a little bit. And also with Manchester, he hasn't really scored that much lately. So we'll have to see how he does. And um, I want to see McAllister, if his time at Liverpool has helped him evolve, because Against Uruguay, I thought he was the weakest player in the whole Argentine team. Like, I thought he didn't perform very well. And also, we have to see if Enzo recovers in time. Because Enzo had a surgery recently. He's been playing. A groin injury or something, yeah. Yeah, he he had been playing with pain for, like, the last eight months. But he didn't want to lose his starting position with Chelsea and everything. But now he decided, like, the most prudent prudent thing to do is get that surgery. So we'll see if he gets there on time. And also, he can also be uh, a Paris-eligible player because he's only 23 years old. So so what I'm seeing right now for Enzo, I don't think this is – it says out for the season, but yeah. I don't know what that – I don't know what they mean by that. I feel like that's not clear enough, but I don't know if they mean out for the entire year or if they just mean like these last couple of games. Or game, yeah. essentially. And then another player that I think could be important is Cuti Romero. Cause mm-hmm. he had a, for example, I, I don't know if you saw this, but against Arsenal, he had a really good first half. But then in the second half when Arsenal scored, like I felt, I don't know if you felt the same thing, but I felt that, that Tottenham like, let Arsenal score. Because if you look at that play, they were all like jogging. They weren't going seriously after the ball, and they left these yeah. really big spaces in the back. And you're like, 
that's kind of weird because Tottenham never does that. And then <laughs> Holland was alone in the middle of the area. Like, how can you explain that? I don't know. I, it felt kind of weird. But besides that mistake, I feel like he has been solid for the Spurs. And also, um, Martinez recovered also for for Manchester United. So he's probably going to be in the roster. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to see if he, I don't think Herman Pesela is going to make it this time. He made it to the World Cup roster. I don't know if he's going to make it now. Um, Marco Senesi, who plays for Bournemouth, I think he's another potential player that might make it, not as a starter, but as a bench player. And where I do see a problem for Argentina is in the fullbacks. Like, uh, you have, um, what's this guy's name? Uh, Huevo Acuna, who hasn't been, like, in tip-top shape this season. You also have uh, Montiel, who hasn't played that much. Yeah. And then in the other... Other wing, you have, uh, I forgot this guy's name, the Atletico de Madrid guy. Oh, Nahuel Molina. Yeah. Nahuel Molina. Yeah, yeah. Molina, he's been, it's probably been his best season for Atletico because in the mm-hmm. last ones, he was always getting criticized, rightfully so, and this time he has been okay for them. So we'll have to see. I don't know. The, the thing that concerns me about Argentina is the whack-ass friendlies that they've had after the World Cup. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> hey. I mean, I mean, for a team, I, just, for a team, I, I know, I know what you mean. For yeah, a team like Argentina, you. they only played against like Curacao and teams like that. And um, yeah. I don't know, I felt like against Uruguay, Argentina suffered because they weren't used to playing matches of that intensity. Well, I also feel that it's because Marcelo Bielsa knows. Argentina like the palm of his hand like he knows Scaloni he knows what he thinks because I feel Scaloni has a little bit of Bielsa in him too so so he knows very well he knew what were Argentina's pain points and he also knew that he had a play uh you know a, a pool of players that are very fast that are tactically very smart like the Pelistris, Darwin Nunez all those guys so so he was really able to damage Argentina a lot but I don't know because that same team then went to Brazil and won against Brazil so <laughs> So I I do think Argentina has everything to qualify to the next round, but I don't think it's going to be as easy as you think. And I also feel that they might struggle against Chile, not because Chile has like the best squad, but because those games always get heated. Argentina Chile is a very spicy rivalry, one of the hottest ones in South America, and Chile always plays with all they have against Argentina, and they, they can be kind don't, of don't get your PTSD. Don't get your PTSD ahead of you, man. Like I, I know. 2015 and 2016, there, there's a lot of PTSD from that, but oh, it's geez. okay, man. It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to worry about Chile anymore. You don't have to worry about... <laughs> hey. <laughs> I, I don't think Chile is as strong as they once were, but I do think yeah. that they always have that um, competitive gene that comes out against Argentina. They always Something try to do them. their best. Um, and they have players... Well, we're going to talk about Chile later, but they have players that know what it's like to beat Argentina and in important matches, and they'll probably be there, unfortunately, because Chile has also struggled with that demographic <laughs> transition, you know. So Grandpa, Grandpa FC right there. Yeah, yeah. like Peru and Chile <laughs> have very similar squads when it comes to, like, age distribution. Like, mm-hmm. not many young players. Like, in Argentina that won the World Cup, of course, they have some experienced players, but you also have some players that are on the rise, and you can tell that they're going to take – Messi spot. They're going to take Di Maria spot. You already know there are some candidates. You already know that when Messi leaves, a number 10 shirt can go maybe to McAllister because he, he can play a very similar role or that Di Maria has like uh, Matias Oble behind him. So there's a young player that can take his spot or Luca Romero or, or Gauto. So you have many players that could, you know, be los relevos. But with Chile and Peru, you struggle to see that a little bit. Yeah. That's true. Julian, you want to say it or am I good to go? Go, go ahead. Go. I, you know, man, Gabriel, you said every name, every single name, but there was one name and I'm surprised you didn't say it. The Pitbull, the Bodyguard. The Paul. Oh, oh, the, oh, the Rodrigo De yeah, Paul, yeah. man. I mean, this guy, I mean, I don't know if you want to call him David Beckham Jr., you know, after what he did with his hair or the Bodyguard, or, but this guy, I think he's the motor. He's the engine. I think he is. When you're waking up in the morning, you got to go to work. You got to grab your car keys. I think that's your Rodrigo DePaul. You got to have something with you. You got to have your car keys. How are you going to start your car? It's the the way I feel with Argentina. 
He is the motor of the team. And not just honestly, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch. This guy, I mean, obviously he's gotten the nickname of the bodyguard for a reason, you know, with Messi, but also not just with him, but with Di Maria, with even, I don't know if you guys remember, Vogue Veghorst at the World Cup when they beat the Netherlands was trying to talk to, I want to say it was Enzo, or it might have been, I can't remember exactly who it was, but Rodrigo came in there, completely swooped his, his teammate away, and they walk off, you know. So he, he's a leader on the field and off the field. Um, obviously, you know, Gabriel even really, like, hit well with some of the names. Uh, the center back, that position, I know there's a guy that plays in Lens. I want to say is Medina, Facundo Medina. Yeah, Facundo Medina. Facundo Medina, he's been having an incredible season with Lens. Really, really, really good. The thing is, though, he might have to be the next guy up because I don't know the exact right now with Lisandro with Lichi. I don't know. I know he's been injured in and out. Hopefully he's able to make it back. But Ultimendi, I Ultimendi has, has always been one of those guys. I, I don't right. want to say that I don't rate. He has good, I mean, great games. But I don't know if you guys saw this. Gabriel, I know you saw it because I saw you post it on the cover page. But Puma Rodriguez sauced him up and then walked right by him and shot and scored. And and not to take away, Puma is, you know, off topic. He's one of my favorite players for the national team. I love watching him play. But Ultimendi, I mean, the guy literally looked like he was like in another planet. Like he's all over the place. So I think that's a big key, key thing. I mean, like you said, they and have Kutu Romero. He's old. I mean, he's up yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, remember 30, that like in, in the final in the final against France, he's the one that yeah. committed that stupid penalty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the thing oh, is, shit, yeah. he, he brings up a lot of risk in the team. I mean, like you said, the midfield as well. I mean, that that's really the trio, I feel, with McAllister, Enzo Fernandez, and Rodrigo DePaul. My big thing also kind of looking at it is, obviously, we're talking right now group stage and we're looking at it. You know, kind of for the overview of the team, and we'll talk a little bit about negatives and positives. I think a big negative, I mean, Gabriel, you hit the nail on the head with the friendlies, just whack ass games like, what, what, what are you doing playing El Salvador and stuff? But also at the same time, I got to say the pressure. I feel as if almost the media, uh, us as fans, us as creators, everybody, even almost even like people on their own team, I feel like there's almost this sense of, yeah, you have to be in the final, it's automatic. The finals in Miami. The the final is meant for you. Your star, the goat of your team, the goat of the world, plays in this city. So it's almost like supposed to be this like final destiny. You have to make it there and win it and win your sixteenth one and you know be the all time leader for Copa Americas and stuff. But it just seems like there's so much pressure on this team. Now, granted, one thing I will say, kind of transitioning over to positives, is this team can handle the pressure. This team has been able to show when there's pressure on them, not just in their leagues domestically for the players individually, but also within uh, the national team. They can handle that pressure a lot of times. And like you even said, Julian, you were mentioning their two losses, Saudi Arabia and Uruguay. The Saudi Arabia one, obviously, we all were like, that came out of you know yeah. left field. Nobody believed that. Even the Uruguay loss, for myself, Argentina won every single game leading up to that qualifier. If I'm not wrong, that was their fifth game, I want to say. And, it, you know, the game was also – the game was in La Bombonera. You know, they played at home. So it was kind of like, you know – and obviously Uruguay, I mean, you know, we'll get to them later in this series. They're, that's a phenomenal team as well, and they have a great coach under Bielsa. But the thing is, that those were kind of shocking losses. So I think for Argentina, the thing is, you know, obviously we're going to talk about, you know, more with the group stage and with these opponents, but we really shouldn't look past the fact that they could get upset. They could – they easily – I don't want to say easily, but let, let's not put it behind our minds and say it's impossible. That's not going to happen. They could lose to Chile. I was looking it up, not even going to lie, while we were on the pod, and I was looking into it. The last time Argentina beat Chile at the uh, Copa America was 2016. Now, granted, that wasn't super, super long ago, but they played them again, if I'm not wrong, in 2019. I want to say they drew them. They played them for sure in the COVID year, and they tied them as well. Chile gets up for this game. I don't know whether it's this South American derby. It's just a rivalry, the cultural rivalry, whatever it is, being neighbors, you know. But there, there is such a, a big distinct whenever Chile, even Peru as well, these teams get up for these games. I think with the Canada game, I think they're going to be able to just completely take care of them. I think they're going to mollywop Canada, to be quite honest, dude. I, I don't see it being a close game, my prediction for that. But 
I think there's so many players, there's so many guys on the team, but I think it's going to be the role players, though. It's going to be the guys that come off the bench. Uh, it's kind of like, in, you know, not to use a basketball analogy, but it's it's going to be your sixth man. You know, who is going to be that guy to come off the bench? You know, whether it's Guido Rodriguez, whether it's maybe Nahuel Molina, or even if it's Nicolas Tagliafico, you know, or Nico Gonzalez, you know, these type of guys, they're going to have to really go into those roles because it's going to be tough games and teams are not going to shy away from them. Obviously, it's Argentina. I mean, they're World Cup champs for a reason, but I don't think anyone is genuinely super frightened other than obviously, you know, Central American teams and other ones. But I don't think Chile is afraid of this game. I think Chile looks at it as like an opportunity to say, hey, let's go. Let's run it back. Let's let's play this game. So. Yeah, I think there there's a counter argument to the the pressure one, which is that because Argentina already won it all, they might not be as pressured to win this one. And Messi's like in his farewell tour. Well, he has been in in it since 2023. Because you can tell that with Inter Miami, he's like a I don't know. He seems more free. Like he's playing for the fun of it because he knows his career is like close to its end. So. So he doesn't have that pressure to win it all because he already well he pretty much already won it all, and actually well this is a something for another episode. But a friend of mine told me I think the most pressured team in this Copa America is actually the U.S. because this is the moment that they have to prove themselves that they're actually grown. Because in the past yeah they 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 whooped Mexico's ass but like right right now who's Mexico? Let's be honest. So mm-hmm. now at Copa America they're in a they're in a group that. Okay, they have two teams that are might be on paper inferior to them, and then they have one that's like much better than them on paper. You never know in football. So if they really want to show the world that hey, now Americans are good at soccer too, and that we're serious about our project, they have to make it far in this Copa America. Like if they don't, then they'll get they'll get heavy heavily criticized and also bullied by people from all, all other countries. So I don't know. I, I mean Argentina. They might have some pressure, but I don't, I don't see like the media is like, oh, tenemos que ganar Copa América. I don't see them and they're like going that crazy over Copa América. But we'll see, we'll see, because uh, once the team starts losing and the fans start like losing steam and they stop supporting, things change. So we'll we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of with you on that, Gary, because there there is a like a level of because. In the 2021 Copa America, that's all they could talk about. It's like how Argentina and Messi and Messi's era have have yet to win an international trophy. But now all that's it's it's behind them. They they won in 2021. They won the World Cup. Sure, is there an expectation? At the end of the day, it is Argentina. Like it, those fans are rabid. It's it's insane. Like football is life over there. So obviously they want to win it and they they expect to win it. But I also don't think it's going to be the end of the world if they lose either. Yeah. And if you look at that, if you look at all the favorites to get out of each group, Argentina's group is the easiest. And it's not even close. Like it, because you have Group B, Ecuador, Mexico. That's a little bit contentious. That's going to be a tight game. You have Brazil, Colombia. Colombia is coming in super, super hot. And then a Brazil team who's a little weaker than normal, but I think they're better than people are getting credit. And then you have Uruguay and United States. We don't even know who really the favorite to get out of second place. I mean, we have in our opinions who we think is going to get out in second, but like, is there like a clear cut second place favorite? No, I think everybody, this is, this has got to be the easiest group. So for me, the high, look, I agree with you, Will. I think if there's any game they're going to rack it up on, it's going to be Canada because Canada has the worst defense out of yeah. four teams on here. And and that's why I say Canada's only chance of really competing in this group is they're just going to have to put up points. They're going to have to score and steal and create errors and whatnot. So, look, the low, man, low would be like a, a Chile tie like a tie i i can't even say they're low as them losing because i just i i can't fathom it like it's it's and like we know that chile argentina game is going to be an argentina home game that's going to be a big time argentina home game i think they're all gonna be home games for argentina 
think the Peruvian game, yeah, I mean, them against Canada too, but I think the Peruvian game, you're going to get a lot, especially in South Florida, you're going to get a lot of uh, Peruvian, so I think you might get a 50-50 there. Yeah, everywhere else is going to be pretty much a home game for them. I think the problem for that match is going to be, <laughs> well, you're going to have a lot of people with very high purchasing power, because I checked the ticket prices and they were like, whoa. <laughs> Oh, oh my God, dude. Yeah, very uh, I can't even imagine. I can't even. Oh. I mean, I, I, I'm here and go to the inner Miami games and stuff. Like, I can't even imagine what that Copa America ticket price. I mean, I've heard just even like the ones in Kansas are like absurd <laughs> prices. <laughs> like, yeah. Com- is going to cash out. They're going to take the opportunity of being in the United States to absolutely cash out. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, we keep on talking about them. Oh, wait. Actually, both of you guys give your highs and lows. I forgot. We'll yeah. Continue. Gabriel. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah. Gabriel, you want to start us off with highs and lows? What do you think for Argentina? Sure. So highs, well, because they're reigning world champions, reigning Copa America champions, um, mm-hmm. finalissima champions. I should be champion. Yeah. 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 Low. I think. I guess something terribly bad happens. Hmm. I don't know. The only team that concerns me, strangely enough, about this side of the bracket is Mexico, and not because Mexico is that good, but because they're going to they're gonna have the entire stadium in their favor if they are played. I'm pretty sure about that. Oh, you're talking about outside the group. Yeah. yeah like if oh. they, uh, The group, it, they should make it. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said the low is like maybe, maybe a Chile tie, maybe, but I'd be shocked. At that. Yeah, but then after you know, after beating also Canada and Peru, so yeah, it yeah. would be kind of irrelevant. But I think low, like that, me- that Mexico game concerns me, but I think a low would be fourth place. You know, Gabriel, I, this is kind of funny. I was doing like the math one day and I was thinking about it and I kind of was like matching up like you, you were saying, what are like realistic chances, you know, and who could they play if Mexico? And this is this is very realistic. If Argentina wins the group, which that's kind of looking like where we're predicting around the table. And it looks like I think they will as well. And Mexico finished second place. That game will be played on the 4th of July. Air. And that it's like a, I think a nine thirty o'clock start time, if I'm not wrong, for Eastern time. I think it's and in Texas. It's in. Te- I think it's in Houston. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it's in Houston. Fourth of July. I mean, dude, you're you're talking fireworks. And I kind of got to agree with Gabriel. I, I, I don't see. I can't. I don't know. I don't see them honestly getting knocked out. I don't see them getting group. I just do not realistically can see them getting group. I mean, the only chance they get group is three teams tie with five points. And Argentina by somehow miraculously of God, they're, you know, left out on the group stage by goal differential. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they could lose a game. I think they could have a wake up call. I think very easily in that second game against Chile, they could mollywop Canada in the first one, kind of feel comfortable. And then in that Chile game could draw. Maybe I I don't want to say they're going to lose. But they could easily, you know, we were talking about it earlier. Chile gets up for this game, so that could be a that could be kind of a wake up call for Argentina. But I will say though, the low is going to be a quarterfinal. This team could get bounced out early. It, it's very very probable. I mean, I obviously this was a whole, you know, everybody's debating about it, talking whether or not he's coming back or or he's leaving. But even like Lionel Scaloni, you know, I didn't know. I'll be honest myself. I was kind of doubting whether or not he would come back. Like, if you see interviews with him from the big news they have in Argentina, it's TYC Sports. You know, TYC, they interviewed him, and he's kind of like, yeah, you know, I'm ready. Like, I mean, the dude literally looked like he woke up from a nap. Like, he's just like, yeah, man, you know, it's whatever. So he didn't really look like he was all up for it. But, obviously, it's been confirmed a couple months ago. He is coming back. Yes, he's going to be returning for this tournament. Whether or not what he does after it, we'll see. But going into the high, though, absolutely the high has to be i mean winning the whole thing i mean th- this is a manageable group they're obviously on the manageable way more manageable side of competing on that side of the bracket with potentially maybe facing uh venezuela with potentially maybe facing mexico or even ecuador so it- it's definitely a high of them winning but it's going to be obviously the route there the games they're going to have to play and we also have that to watch route out it's so in- easy that route is so easy. You think so? You're bypassing Uruguay, Colombia, 
And obviously, they're never going to put Brazil on the same side of the bracket. Yeah. 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 I mean, no, 100%. There's undoubtedly, this is the easier side of the bracket. And, you know, whether people want to call it corrupt, FIFA, you know, Johnny Infantino money, whatever it is, I still think it's definitely, it's the easier side of the bracket. And we'll see. So. All right. Since you guys did the whole tournament, let me redo mine. So, obviously, high, winning it all. I think they're low is losing to Brazil in a final. Because I think Brazilian fans are never, after, like, you know, a lot of Brazilian fans are super salty after the last Copa America. Like, oh, you won with no fans in the stadium. Like, it was an empty stadium. No one was there. You won. But then when the bright lights are on and people are actually there, you lost. So I think just because of the, the shit talk and, like, the bragging rights, that's the low. Because, like you said, the, they're the toughest team behind Argentina in that entire side of the bracket is Ecuador. And is Ecuador beating Argentina? No. Like, it, to me, like, the low is losing to Brazil in a final. They in could. Miami. That's a bold. That's a bold take, Julian. Automatic finals. Is Ecuador a team who struggles to score going to put up? Look, Argentina is going to drop three goals every single game leading up to the final. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I don't know, man. <laughs> I, <laughs> Dude, I, I think I, if you look at the, like uh, Conmebol qualifiers, they've been pretty tight. Like most of the scores, like Argentina's only big victory has been in Bolivia, three nil, and that's yeah. it. Everything else, Paraguay 1-0, Ecuador 1-0, even, I mean, Brazil, of course, but still Brazil 1-0. Like, this this team can fire on all cylinders, but I think, I mean, honestly, kind of counteracting my point, Gabriel was right, and even Julian, you said it as well. The pressure is, in my opinion, I feel like it's in there in a way, but it's also not. It's kind of lackluster. I mean, it's kind of like a, it's like, I mean, it's like you're tossing a pizza. You got it one moment, you don't got it the next moment. Like, this team is going to feel pressure, but also at times, I think genuinely in the group stage, I think there's only the Canada game. Like I said, it's the first game. It's in Atlanta. They're going to get hype. This stadium is going to be packed out, sold out for Messi, for the team, for all these guys. Other than that, I don't think they're going to molly Watt Peru. I don't think they're going to beat Peru 5-0 to zero or 4-1 to one or even 3-0. to zero. I, I think they'll be genuinely more tight affairs, but that's Argentinian football, though. That's how they win games, and they do it still in a convincing fashion, though. They make these games look tight, and, but when in reality, they're winning comfortably. They know they have it. They're comfortable in the back. Their midfield's connected. Everything's shooting from the front, up top. So, I, You know what's they, funny? Is that I feel like there's like this... I feel like Mexico feels that they have a rivalry with Argentina, but Argentina doesn't feel the same way. Nah. <laughs> at all they just, they like i always them, hear like mexican and like mexican fans always going super hard for like the argentina mexico games but yeah what argentina always does and i know gabriel you said that you you were scared about that game in texas potentially which is the way it potentially might look out looking like it might be i don't think it matters man all argentina ever does is bully mexico constantly like every like i want to i have to look at the head-to-head but that just they constantly bully Mexico. Yeah, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say scared, but I think it is a game where Argentina. Yeah, I, I, yeah, lose. I like should have said scared. Yeah, yeah. If, <laughs> if the if like the mood and the vibe is right, like if the stadium is packed with Mexicans and you know Mexico has a good group stage, because I think it depends on that too. Because Mexico is a team that's very reliant on like vibes and results. Mm-hmm. Like if if they make it to the quarterfinals, but they kind of suck. Uh, I think Argentina is going to have an easy match. But if, if they're solid, well, solid and don't end in first place, then I think um, they're going to they're gonna make Argentina struggle. They're going to yeah. need 2014 Guillermo Ochoa. They're going to need 2014 Ochoa. Hey, he didn't even get called up, so. <laughs> well, oh, he didn't? Oh. No, no. So that's a whole we'll, – yeah. we'll be talking about Group B in the next one. That's a – you guys probably yeah, saw, we'll, uh, I don't yeah. know if you saw. All right, let, yeah. let's let's uh we're kind of we're getting uh kind of long. So let's let's finish the final team right here. Let's talk we talked about them briefly throughout the entire show. Let's get let's get to it. Let's hit Chile. And um Gabriel, I'll let you start on the the preview so, of this team. 
Chile after several not so good processes with coach coaches. I think now they have a pretty good coach, as I said before, with Ricardo Gareca. The big problem that they have is the same problem that Peru has. They're a bunch of old players. They don't have any new young ones that you could say, man, these guys are at the same level. Like, they're good. They have some players like Dario Sori, who plays for Michelin, who was, a, I think, a Ude Chile product. And then you also have um, Marcelino Nunez, who plays for Norwich in the championship. He's also mm-hmm. a very interesting player. Uh, ben Burton, who, I don't know, he had a really hard time in Spain. I didn't see him adapt to Villarreal, and now he's playing in the print. Well, actually, Sheffield just got relegated, but he was good for them. So we'll yeah. see what his next step is in his career. Because I think he he can't continue in Villarreal. La Liga does not adapt to his – well, he doesn't adapt to La Liga's playing style. He's not exactly like a very uh, technical maestro type of player. He's more of a physical player. So we'll see how he does. But then you still have a team that depends on Gary Medel, Arturo Vidal, Claudio Bravo, Alexis Sanchez – there's no new blood, so that might be a big struggle for them. Because is Vidal getting called up? He is in the in the preliminary roster, so we're yeah. gonna have to see if he gets called up to the final tournament. I mean, he's playing in Chile, he's playing for Colo Colo, so we have yeah. to wait. And then Alexis, I mean, Alexis is still playing at a good level, but I mean, come on, you can't keep on depending on 35 year or 36 year old mm-hmm. guy. That, and he's that's really good. playing. He 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 didn't play a whole lot. Um, like coming off the bench for like 20, 30 minutes for Inter and some yeah, games he, he, play. He, he doesn't have the same rhythm that he had in previous seasons where he used to play a lot more. So I don't know. I, I like, I believe that Chile can do some damage to all the teams because of Gareca, because I know what Gareca can do with teams because he makes them behave like a single unit. And they, they're very, you know, they're very like sacrificial teams. Like you don't, they don't have like attacking players that just stay in front, but they actually help out with defense. So we're gonna have to see if he can inject that same style that he had with Peru, because that was very, it was very useful and it was good. And I, I feel like the players really um, understood what he wanted from them. So we'll we'll see if we can pull something off with Chile. But the players, I'm not particularly convinced about them. So. We'll see. We'll see. I think that in their case, like if I would have to imagine a high and low, I think low would be, um, I think they're making it past the group stage. I think uh, out of the three teams, they're the ones with the highest odds of finishing second. So I would say that a low would be quarterfinals and a high would be fourth place, like ma- making it to semis and then losing, but, you know, still managing to make a top four position. Yeah. Wow. You think the low is quarters. Interesting. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, kind of carrying off what Gabriel just said. There's a lot of there's a lot of new a new blood that Gareca tried to call up in this last camp against Albania and also against France. Uh, this is just a little side note for people. Gabriel, I'll I'll let you know real quick, dude. So we we have a little group chat, Julian, Adam, and me, and Julian was dropping a little bit. I was looking at my phone a little bit at work, and he was like, "Oh, he just said I forgot exactly what he said word for word." But if I'm not wrong, Julian was like, this team is hot garbage. They're not going to get out of the group. And and I'm, immediately in my mind, I was like thinking, I remember I was like, hold on, what? And I put my phone down, maybe take you know a few minutes, and I look back at it. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, they're in the same group with Peru, Canada, and Argentina. How well, – in what world is this team, you know – not getting out of the group. I just think it's it's just it, it's meant for them. I think it's built for them. I wasn't looking. I maybe a little bit earlier ago I forgot the head to head record, but they own Peru. I mean they these guys got property. Like that northern border of uh Arise, if I'm pretty sure if I'm saying it right. Arica. Uh, Arica. Arica. Dude, they got property. Like they, they expanded Arica into Peru, bro. Like these guys like, they don't play around when they come to that game. I mean, we saw it also. They played them last year in the World Cup qualifier at home. And, I mean, beat them 2-0 to zero convincingly. I think another big name, kind of going back a little bit to CONCACAF, uh, this guy plays for Club America, Diego Valdez. Valdez has been, I would say, arguably one of Club America's probably best players. And he's not the only Chilean on the team. They have another center back. I'm Ilyichowski. probably going to butcher Ilyichowski, yeah, Igor, Igor. 
And he's been lights out as well. Now, I'd want to say he did pick up a recent injury. I know he did not play against Chivas last night. I know they're in their semifinals right now of the Apertura and stuff. But, I mean, if he's able to get fit and get back into it and get into playing shape again, he's another player that's going to absolutely be be critical for them. I think the old guys, just because Gareca is that type of coach, that he, he brings the best out of you. He's going to bring – I mean, you could be a soft, teddy – you know, a little cutty, you know, a little teddy bear. You're not the strongest, but Garek is going to bring that dog out of you, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's that type of coach. He will get every single ounce from you. I got to say it, I, as much as some people might disagree, it was a little bit of a hot topic. I don't know if you guys saw Ben Bretherton Diaz in the last uh, international friendlies. He ended up getting up, getting called up, but originally for the preliminary squad, he wasn't called up because he not he did not speak the best Spanish. Yeah. That, I mean, you guys, I, I don't know about y'all. I think that's kind of ballsy. I'm not going to lie. He's arguably one of your your most talented, one of your best players. But Gareca was one of the a, highest level leagues. Yeah. And, and the thing is, he sent a message straight away to the team and said, I'm not here to F around. I'm not here to play around. I'm here to get results and I'm going to do it however. I mean, whether it's starting 41-year-old Claudio Bravo in the goalkeeping position or 39-year-old Gary Mandel, who... I mean, literally, he looks like my math teacher in high school. Like, he's short, he's stubby, but the dude's an absolute dog, man. So the team all around, obviously, like Gabriel was even pointing to, they're having a transition period, and they're really struggling. And, excuse me, they're really struggling within being able to formally transmit. But I think one difference, though, between them and Peru, and even Gabriel, we were talking about it with Peru, they just don't have – they're going from Paulo Guerrero – to a John Luca Lapadula who's already 34 years old, Chile does have a little bit more youth mm-hmm. to them. Obviously, with Nunez, uh, I think this kid's going to be lights out. I think this is his tournament. Him and Dario Osorio, they really, really, they both got to step up for this. I think they will. They've shown it in their previous friendlies. They showed it in World Cup qualifiers. I think it's going to be a big test for them. And I also think for a lot of these guys that play in the Chilean league, because a lot of them do – uh, if I'm not wrong, their goalkeeper, who I think he should start over Claudio Bravo, uh, Brian Cortez, he plays with Colo Colo, saw him play last night. You know, a lot of these guys, th- this is a, a, a testament for them to be able to show that they can play outside of Chile. You know, obviously the Chilean league is probably arguably probably one of the top three or four leagues within Come Bowl, but now it's time for them to show it at the world stage in Copa America. So, I think there's a lot going on with it, obviously, with players. I think a big name. We lost you for a second, Will. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, Yeah. you're good now. You're good now. We lost you again. Good. Oh, shoot. They just don't want me to say his name. I know you're back now. You're back now. Say his name. They don't want you to hear (laughs) <laughs> I, they don't want to. Hey, they don't. Hey, the haters are canceling him, bro. Eduardo Vargas, but he he's a guy that can bring a lot to the table. I mean, he scored in their last international window against Albania, um, and that's you know what? Maybe maybe this is a little bit of a, this is a little bit off topic. But for Julian, I want to say also, guys. Julian said, and Gabriel, I want to get your opinion. I'm really intrigued to hear what you think about this. Mm-hmm. Do you think the Albania win was? Obviously, it wasn't a world-class win, but would you say it was a good win? It was a solid win? Yeah, I mean. Not for Julian. I not for okay, hold up. No, you're taking what I said. <laughs> Obviously. For a team that was struggling to get results, I think just winning in Europe, even though it's not like the best exactly. goal, I think it's it's good. Exactly, yeah. and that's what I was saying. Will was acting like they beat France. Like I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, look. Obviously, considering what they've been going through, and they just they need a win. You have your. I think that was was that Gadeka's first game. Um, going in like, it it looked like they came to life, and it's a Chile a Chile team you haven't seen play like that in a long time. I think it was a good result, and say, but I'm not gonna like rave about it like oh my god they beat albania like i'm not like and i know a lot of but, chilean fans are really no, no, really hyped the, about the, the france I, result in but, like albania's defense they were all right in their qualifying group for the euros so they they had some pretty tough competition czech republic and yeah. poland and yet they came out on top so i don't think they're like a bad team 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah, they're not Germany or Spain or France, but they're on the right side. Where would Albania rank in Copa America? Out of the uh, 16 teams? Out of the 16 teams. They're definitely better than, than Costa Rica. I mean, that's that's not a question. I think they're fourth team. Are we talking now? Wait, wait. Are we talking depth wise, like chart wise, like player pool? They're bottom. I think they're bottom three. Uh, however you shake it, I think. Uh, whether no. I mean, you can say depending on how Jamaica is. Like, I think that can be a little bit of a. I'll say this: they're better than Panama. They're better than Costa Rica. They're better I than Bolivia. Panama. So that's. <laughs> I think funny. that's where it stops. <laughs> uh, Peru. They're better than Peru. They're better than. I don't know, man. I would say they're better than Paraguay. I, I would I will go, say I would Albania go. is definitely punching above their weight. Absolutely. Yeah. They're definitely yeah. punching above their weight. But yeah, I mean, um, but then I like, I look at these past like previous games and let me pull it up here. Of oh, Chile? And look, it, it, it's, it's a little weird because obviously you're now getting Gareca in here, which can completely rechange and shape the way that this Chilean team plays. But the guys that they're relying on, and we kind of talked about a little bit with like Alexi Sanchez, it's like none of these guys, like Vargas, like they're not Davia, like these guys are not the Villa or however you pronounce, not two L's. They're not playing a lot. Mm -hmm. Like these are guys that are not consistently playing the only one who seems to currently, at least in club form, and obviously club is different than country, but there is something to say. Like, if you have guys who aren't really getting a lot of playing time and on top of that not playing super well, you're not getting a lot of minutes going into a very important tournament. And Nunez seems to be the only one that's really, like, getting consistent playing time. And not only that, but playing at very high level. Yeah. And he seems to be the one guy that's really sticking out to me on this team. Look, I think the France result was good. Um, not bad. Uh, I thought the first goal was actually a really well tactically made goal. Um, but the second goal was a mistake on Francis' part and happened to just be kind of like a golazo from outside the box. Like, other than that, France, like, really worked the dance. So, I, I just, I don't feel like I, <laughs> the only teams that they're beating is Peru. And they're getting some decent draws. I'll give them that. Like, they have a draw against Colombia. Um, they did draw against Paraguay, but then they also lost to Venezuela 3-0. Yeah. And then outside of those games, we're going a little far back to 2022. And the one thing Will mentioned to me is like, oh, but you're talking about Common Bowl. That's a whole different story. I'm like, okay. They lost 2-0 to South Korea. They lost 2-0 to Tunisia. They lost on um, pens, or uh, they would they drew against Ghana. They lost two zero to Morocco. They went two two to Qatar and lost one zero to Poland. Like these are all teams outside of Comnebol, and not necessarily. I mean, Morocco's good, but Qatar. Yeah, like, I think that the big difference between that Chile and this Chile is not even a squad. It's Gareca. So yeah. yeah. And, exactly. that, and that's why I say I hate I have a hard time pulling against that, like because it is almost a different style and way they play. And I, I saw it because I I went and watched coming into this episode. I went and watched that Albania game and I watched that France game, and the way they played was almost completely different compared to what we saw in the qualifiers. But it, I don't know, like like what you're going to get though. Like who, who, you're going to rely on a bunch of guys who really aren't. Playing consistently, unpredictable. Like, Would you yeah, say that? Yeah, it's so unpredictable. So, I agree with that. Yeah. And if you look at history, and even though yeah, you have Gadeka, these are still the same players. And I think they're good enough to beat a Paraguay. They're good enough to beat a Peru, a Bolivia. Um, but like they haven't beaten a team that's a higher rank than them since. They won the Copa America from when I last checked. Yeah. To kind of counter a Except little bit. Me- they did beat Mexico, which I. Yeah. Well, I was going to just say was to kind of counter a little bit. And this is kind of Peru's case as well. 
or Peru has a little bit more of a negative record. Chile's record, and I don't have it right now on me, but I was looking earlier, their record against CONCACAF teams. I mean, Julian, you mentioned a lot of other friendlies that they had against Poland, against South Korea. A lot of those games they did lose. But the thing is, they're not playing teams from Europe. They're not playing teams from Africa or Asia. They're playing other CONCACAF teams. And one of those teams being Canada, I mean, their head-to-head record with most CONCACAF teams is very well. I mean, I don't have to say this. Probably a lot of the people remember, I mean, Siete Acero, you know, that game against Mexico. I think that really established Chile. And they beat us as well earlier in the in that game or in that uh, in the group stage of that tournament in 2016. They beat Panama Cuatro Dos, you know. So this team is very, very uh, I, I kind of like you said, Julian, they're unpredictable. But also, if I had to put another word for them, they're just stubborn. They're a stubborn team that they just don't give up. They've got – I mean, this is kind of – we talk about this and we joke a lot about it here on the pod. This is a team – they've got a bunch of dogs, dude. I mean, Lipchowski. I mean, even these older guys, Vidal. Like, bro, these, these are some dudes. They, they may not be the tallest guys in the world. But, dog, they're some absolute animals when it comes on the field. Like, when I think of the Chile national team, I don't remember in Copa America 2019, Gary Mandel and Leo Messi going, I mean, head-to-head, and these guys are, like, colliding. I don't know if y'all remember the red card that Gary Mandel got. But these guys, they don't care who they're playing. They don't care what they're playing. And they don't care where they're playing. They're going to come, and they're going to bring the hype, and they're going to bring the energy. And I think Ricardo Gareca, obviously – you know, making that jump from Peru over to, I mean, literally the arch rival with Chile. That's a massive, massive statement. But I think this team suits him really well. He's a dog and they're a bunch of dogs. So I think they're going to show, and I mean, Gabriel even said it, I think the big difference with this team, it's not that they've got more infrastructure. It's not that they've got 55,000, you know, youth talented players coming through the system. It's just Ricardo Gareca. I mean, he brings the best out of the players. He really, really, can, he can show his levels when it comes to this. And I think we'll get to it in a minute, but with highs and lows, I just do not see a Canada team who just hired Jesse Marsh. You know, vibes might be getting better in the locker room, but they've had a lot, a lot of questionable results. While Chile right now is coming in not hot, not necessarily this extraordinary team. And it also depends on how they do in their friendlies leading up to this game. But if they can win their friendlies, they already did a really good showcase against, I mean, literally the 2018 champs in France. This is a Chile team that can bring a lot to the table. And I, I think there's just they, they're just a bunch of dogs, man. And that's what I was telling you, Julian. When it comes to Kome Bowl, I mean, the game can look slower. The game can look, you know, not as tiki-taka, as perfect to it. But, but Kome Bowl, man, I mean, these guys don't play. They are coming I understand, to chop but my thing is – how are they going to keep up? I mean, these this is a team that's going to get absolutely gassed, mm-hmm. especially with the way that Jesse Marsh is going to come in against with Canada and the way the speed that they have. I mean, I saw it with France. I mean, obviously, France is a better team than Canada. I'm not saying that they're on the same level, but they have the same a lot of the similar athleticism, especially up top. I don't see how they keep up with them. They're going to be so beyond gassed. And especially with the way Jesse Marsh loves to press and Chile can't create anything, which like maybe they can with the the tactical systems that Gareca can put in. But I just, I see this Chile team, it's going to work against Argentina. I think it's going to work against Peru. But I think stylistically, and that's what I'm going based off mostly, I'm looking at this more from a stylistical standpoint, is this Canadian team is going to run the brakes off of them and what's going to happen if this game goes to extra time like (laughs) i mean they do not have the legs to keep up canada sim that's that's all i'm saying look i don't think canada is a great team i just think with the way they you cannot deny the class that's up top and the speed that they have i mean they no and and that's just what I, i i look at i'm like they're they're going to. I mean, we talk about how old these teams are. <laughs> what makes you think that like they're not? And this is a, t- a Canadian team that is way more clinical. On top of that, way more clinical. So that that's just kind of the way I I, I look at that. And I I feel bad for like a Peru and like a Chile because 
they're kind of stuck because Costa Rica was like that a couple of years ago going into where you're kind of stuck in this weird scenario where you don't really have a whole lot coming up through the ranks and you, you have no choice but to kind of rely on these guys. And hopefully maybe after this world cup, I mean, it's a Copa America. They can find some of that youth and find some people to go through the ranks, but it, it's a, it's a tricky situation where it's like, man, what do we do? But I, I think eventually you got to bite the bullet and just throw some guys out there and see what you got. Because that's what I saw when Gustavo Alfaro came to Costa Rica. He just threw the guys out there. Let's see what we got. Mm-hmm. Because you can't keep on bringing back Brian Ruiz and Celso Borges and Joel Campbell and expect results. Uh, Chile has to hit a point, and whether it's after this tournament or not, they just they got to throw guys out there. You could, and hope that one of these guys can shine and get looks and potentially make moves. You need more Sorios. You need more Nunezes. You, you need more of that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. I I think you want to get into highs and lows for this team. What what are we thinking? Yeah. Uh, Gabriel, we can go uh, start off with our highs and oh, Gabriel, you said he said they, yeah. their low is getting out of the group stage and their high is a fourth place finish. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, what you got? I along the same lines, kind of. I think a low. I, I'll push it down a little bit. I won't go that that far with Chile. I think the low is they don't get out of the group. I think I do see these this team winning a game. Chile, kind of similar to Peru. Now, Peru does have a better uh, Copa America record when it comes to getting out of the group. Chile's last time that they did not qualify out of the group in Copa America was 2004. Ironically, that tournament was held in Peru. This this Chilean team is not used to going to Copa Americas. I mean, hell, dude, they won 2015 and 16. I mean, I guess people could say maybe off of a little bit of luck, but that was just a dog team that they had, dude. So stacked every single position that they had. So I just think this team is inevitable to get at least one win. Now, who's it against? I I could easily see them beating the breaks off of Peru in that first game. Maybe not killing them, but, but finishing them off quite well. And then maybe, you know, tying Canada in some way, somehow, by the, the CONCACAF gods above us or whatever – Canada gets out on goal differential and they also in Peru's bottom team and Canada moves on high for this team though. I genuinely feel that Chile, obviously we've talked about it and we, I kind of sound like a broken record, but they're on the more favorable side. So if Chile gets out, it's not just Argentina where it's like, Oh, they have a favorable team they can face. It's the same thing for Chile. If they get second place, I mean, they could easily play a Mexico or they could play an Ecuador and, and and not to not to bring up Mexican fans, but I don't think that's a game they want to play. I genuinely I think some some fans are are really really uh, pumped for that game. I know uh, that guy over at Deadball TV, Jack. I know he was talking about it being him being a Mexican national team supporter. He wants to play Chile, but I've seen other fans talk about it, say they don't even want to come close to Chile. So th- this could arguably be. Uh, the tournament for Chile to make a semifinal run yet again, to really be able to push their luck and to make it there. And we could be sitting here again, looking at it and saying, yeah, Chile did it again. Chile's in a semifinal. Now they're about to play Argentina again. And who knows from there? You know what I mean? So I think that's the type of Chilean team they have kind of going honestly with the high though. Like you were saying, Julian, I I, I, remarking off of what you're saying. I just don't think that, they're just going to get blown out by Canada. I don't think they're going to get. Ex- I'm not exhausted. saying they're going to get blown out by Canada. Mm-hmm. I just exhausted. I, I don't, think, I don't they think they're going to get tired. Yeah, they could lose. Yeah. Canada's going to three nil them. Like, I don't see that. I don't see a word mm-hmm. like that. Cause Canada's going to be leaky. They're going to give up goals. Mm-hmm. I, I, and like you said, they're going to be leaky, but also the people up front, it's going to be the midfield. You know, for all these teams, obviously, especially for for Peru, for Chile. So we'll see with the talent wise. But we got that team with Chile. You guys want to go ahead and wrap up final predictions for the group? What do you guys think? Yeah, um, I'll say real quick. Hi, Mm -hmm. I think Chile gets out of the group. Um, 
but then they probably lose to Ecuador. Low, I think they get third place. No matter what, they're beating Peru. I don't see them losing to Peru. No. And I think they draw Canada. And maybe it's like goal differential, like I was saying. I think this is going to come down to goal differential. I have, I just have this weird feeling it's going to come down to that. I don't think yeah. either. I don't think I can't. I don't think any of those teams are getting six points outside of Argentina, obviously. But um, yeah, I think high they get out of the group. Um, low they get third place. But uh, okay, yeah, Gabriel, get, uh, give us. I guess we've we've talked yeah. about this debated on certain specific things um i guess your final rank uh how this table the group shakes out first second third fourth um i think it's argentina first chile second <sighs> um i don't know i feel i've changed a little bit since the beginning of the episode and maybe canada third and Peru fourth i changed them <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have no man. skin in the fight. I have the, I just, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jewel, or my bad. Gabriel, do you have any like uh, hot takes? Anything that you can like? It could be like Alfonso Davies is going to be the leading goal scorer in this group, or <laughs> a- any anything you would have to say about this group of hot takes? I think my hot take, and it's one that I know most people don't won't take seriously, but I believe that most of the matches in this group are going to be tight, score-wise. I don't think there's going to be, like, huge goleadas. I think they're all going to be, you know, 1-0, yeah. maybe a 2-0 or a 3-1, but it's not going to be, like, 4-0, 5-0. I think they're going to be a lot closer than people think. I think that's that's spicy, but that's not, like, picante. picante but I, I, could, I could get behind that. I think so. I kind of... Julian, you want to go or? All right. Um, first, I have Argentina. Second, second, I got Canada. Third, Shocker. Chile, Peru. Fourth, hot take. Hot take, man. Messi doesn't score a goal in the group. What are you thinking? Uh, I don't know if it's a hot take because they haven't scored. Uh, let's say Peru doesn't get a goal. Okay. I don't know how hot that is because they really yeah. have only got one goal in six games. They're pulling a Real Sociedad going against uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, PSG. But I, was gonna, I think that's the hottest thing I can really think of that's realistic. Yeah. You're saying this one year ago, Julian? I think the the whole stream fails, dude. I think it blows up to pieces. That's a hot, hot take. After the qualifiers, that's a that that that's a pretty mild take. I agree with you. It's just they haven't been scoring and stuff. So, but yeah, that's true. All right, yeah. Uh, group stage, Argentina first. I think they're going to be able. It'll be. I don't want to say a breeze, but they're going to be able to cruise. I got Chile second. I think this team is built for this. I think Gareca is the guy. I don't. I just don't think he's going to lose in these types of stages. Third place. Uh God, I am so tempted to say Peru. Like it, I wanted. I want to say Peru. I really want to say like they're they're going to push for it. It's Canada so bad, <laughs> dude. I really. The thing is, this is Copa America. Anything can happen. Realistically, I I think Canada will. I think, honestly, like I said, I think they're going to get flabbergasted that first game, and then that second game they're going to kind of start getting back into it. And then maybe that last game they really start picking up steam against Chile. But I'm going to – you know what? Just for the just for the fun of it, I think I'm going to say Peru third, and I think Canada are going to get last. I think, though, my hot take, kind of like similar to Gabriel's, not a, a flaming hot take. I'm just going to go up with the easy, the easy little bucket on this one. I think all these games are going to be very relatively close. We might get a two to zero. We might even get a three to one. But I don't think like hey, no copy and hot takes. Give us another one. Well, maybe maybe that. If I had to say another hot take, this is just kind of me. But I'm gonna say that. Mm, I'm gonna say top goal scorer in this group, at least in the group stage, is gonna be uh, Lapadula. And, and I, I just he 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 can turn on, and if he turns on for one game. 
I mean, like you, we were talking about, it may be like low scoring games. So realistically, if Lapadula scores two goals, three goals, he'd probably be the top goal scorer in the group. So I could see something like that happening. Damn. But yeah, that, that is, that is, that is pretty high. That is very <laughs> hot. You're, you're picking a guy from a team who's only scored one goal in this game versus Argentina. <laughs> Dude, it's the mask, bro. He turns into Batman. I don't know what it is. He, he's yeah. the Batman of Comable. So, yeah, man. we'll see. Um, but yeah, that's the end of our Group A preview. If you guys made it to the end, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Gabriel, once again, where can people follow some of your content and stuff that you make? And what you do yeah so you can follow cabra centro where i'm the social media manager but also with some friends i have a small pod it's called it's in spanish we have a couple of episodes in english but it's called clavado un bar it's like the it's like the mana song but instead of like a bar like where you go and drink it's var as in video as for <laughs> free. So it's, a, it's a play on words but yeah you can you can check us, our episodes on Spotify and on YouTube and also on Goals TV where we're, we're slowly starting to upload our stuff mostly on audio format but we're gonna try and get more video stuff out but yeah we have interesting interviews on Haitian football Dominican football uh, Trinidad and Tobago Cuba Mexico so if you're into all that stuff if you really love Concacaf content just give us a follow on Instagram and Twitter for X Awesome. Great. All that's going to be down in the description below. Um, but yeah, once again, guys, oh. thank you. You made it to the end. And you guys haven't done so already. Please like and subscribe to the content. We greatly appreciate it. All the new subscribers coming. We love you guys. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys at the Group B preview. See Peace you guys later. out, y'all. Later, guys.